Hello everyone and welcome to this AIN Big Topic webinar. Uh, we're very pleased this week to introduce Rebecca Stockley. And Rebecca is going to lead a session for us on the topic of presence. Uh, we're recording the session, so it'll be available for people afterwards. Uh, Rebecca, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Paul. And uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on where you are in the, in the world. When I was in acting school, one of the things that we, we agreed upon in the theater department was that presence was one thing that could not be taught. It just seemed that some actors had stage presence and some didn't. And I don't believe that anymore. I, I've matured. Uh, I think there are components of behavior that we can identify and then learn to control that give us presence. And a lot of that has been outlined in the description that Kat put into the, to the chat for us. Thank you, Kat. And this is not an official AIN document yet. This is a, uh, what would we call it, Kat? A working, a working description of presence? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, AIN is beginning to do is identify the skills of an, uh, of an AIN uh, facilitator the and the competencies that make for a good facilitator. And presence is one of those competencies. And so I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity for us to explore some of what we perceive, those of us who have joined this call, some of what we perceive as the as the the behaviors that I think it is behaviors that make get that give people presence and uh, and i'll i'll just I'll just kick it off by talking about that illusion that it seems that we couldn't that couldn't be taught when I was in theater school. the elusive thing being yeah. the ability for a person to Hi, Matt. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, there's, there's this ability that some people have to be in the moment. And in, in the moment, being uh, aware of their surroundings, being in their bodies, breathing, uh, being grounded, rather than uh, being activated, hyper, uh, uh, full of adrenaline, and uh, zipping around the room in a, in a manner that makes it um, maybe challenging to attend to them or even uh, uncomfortable to attend to them. So the idea that, that a, a, a competent facilitator is grounded, present, and can take the, the room is one of the, I, that's one of my theories. So I wanted to kick that out there and see what kind of responses people might have to that. Uh, yeah, grounded seems a really good word that begins to give a behavioral basis for presence. A uh, facilitator or any presenter who seems to be stable rather than dancing around and out of control of their energy would be the beginning of presence for me. Do you want to indicate, Rebecca, who else you, you're calling in? Uh, let's see. Oh, am I the only one who can see everyone who's here? Uh, no, others can see everyone, but you're in charge. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so if you have something you want to add, just speak up and I will, thank you for muting when you're not speaking, guys. Um, and yeah, anybody have somebody? Um, something? This is Kat. Uh, I love the idea of presence being connected to being present. That's elegant and true, but not always intuitive. And I think in a lot of presentation skills courses, it's taught 
uh, or focused on sort of the opposite way. Can you, can you help me understand what, what you're talking about the opposite way? Well, I think a lot of bad presentation skills result in people being less present. It, it results in people being taught to focus on the wrong things like how, where am I putting my hands or what am I supposed to memorize ahead of time or what do I look like and getting very much more self-conscious and out of the moment as opposed to really being present and relaxed and grounded. Yeah. So the idea of present, being, being present and having presence is very elegant and also very aligned with the applied improv approach to creating more presence. Yeah, I, I go along with that. There's a, uh, being on the west coast of the United States, we have a lot of influence of uh, of airy fairy, touchy feely mindfulness, and uh, I, I'm sorry to diminish mindfulness in that way, but it, <laughs> but being present is being, from my perspective, is being grounded, and and breathing, and uh, and being mindful so that you're attentive to the people in the room, than anxious about what comes next or worried about what you said a moment ago. You're here and you're now, and you're attending to what is now. And uh, yeah, just as, as Paul mentioned, being grounded, being stay, being present. Does anyone else have any, anything to add about that aspect of, of presence? Well, I guess I'd, I'd offer is a kind of um, yes and and yes but at the same time. Because uh, definitely I can experience the grounded quality of when we use the expression, you're present, you're present in a group. But I absolutely um, buy into the kind of airy, fairy version of mindfulness, but it's absolutely possible to be present in the world uh, and to really tune into every corner of possibility. And, and maybe to build a, just a tiny bit of continuity from the webinar I was involved with a few months back where we talked about this. It's just an alternative view is that being present in the present is only one aspect and quite difficult usually sometimes present in the moment it's called or present in the now but another kind of view coming out of quantum physics is around the idea of being present in the field of possibility uh, and to be present in that place of potential it's possible to be present in history to be present in the past and finding as a living thing still playing into it our froze or did vibration. i um, it's possible to be present in the future and it's possible to be present in the now um, and not just present in the moment, which is a quite traditional improv view. Um, and so I, I would just expand it wider. Present isn't only about being grounded in the now, it's about being grounded in the field of possibility that includes the past and the future. Thank you, Paul. That's elegant. I, yeah. And that really fits in with, uh, with improvisation. From my perspective, when we're working with a group of people, being present in the field of possibility is about what might be brought into the space, this, this space being a virtual space, but what might be brought into the space that I didn't anticipate. It, that's a, yeah, I, that's very lovely. Uh, anything else, Paul? Does anybody else have anything about, about just got, that being present aspect? You, you've got David. Uh, can you see Rebecca, everybody? I see, the but I couldn't tell that David ha had anything. I wasn't. Yeah, he, he was waving. So when you were talking, Kat, what came to mind is thinking about my ability to be present to myself and to others is based on whether I can accept that things won't go right, right all the time. And if I can't accept that, oh, I'm feeling agitation, then I'm trying to fix that agitation or fix that person in the room. And so to be present is to say yes to yep that just happened or yes i'm feeling this anxiety and to have this in a sense spaciousness i think of allowing that yeah i see your, i see your hand john Hi. Uh, i was going to say that uh, one thing that it 
it connects to for me is um, it was actually before I did improv, I was doing work as a professional facilitator uh, and training folks in a, in a graduate program for it. And one thing that uh, I started learning in improv that then really connected for me like, oh yes, this is what we're trying to teach people when we're teaching them to be facilitators, is this notion in improv of the difference between pushing scenes versus being open to discovery. Uh, this idea, instead of thinking about, thinking, trying to think ahead in the scene to instead be, uh, not that it's never wrong to make those sort of uh, proactive, forward-looking choices, but to really lean into an, as much as possible discovery, being open to be surprised, uh, don't be distracted by what's supposed to happen. And I think for me, a lot of where that connects with the sort of mindfulness and openness and holding space uh, that a facilitator is asked to do is being willing to hold the space to not only be the contradictory roles of being the steward of the agenda, but also being open to what's actually happening uh, and to not try to sort of push the scene of what you're facilitating. Rebecca, you're muted. You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, the you could tell I was talking. The um, open to discovery connected with that is that there is no supposed Hylia. There is no supposed to happen uh, in in an improv scene. From my perspective, it, it it's only the potential of what will happen. And if I go into a, a course that I'm training without a bias about what is supposed to happen. I'm much more likely to witness what is happening in the room and have an experience with the participants. And I find that when I've created my own content, that's much more doable. When I'm applying someone else's content or perhaps uh, providing uh, a training to a really large group of people where I'm only doing one component and it's been decided in advance what not, must be covered. I find that sometimes I'm bounded by that content and it takes me away from what's really going on in the room. And, and it makes me feel much less present. So I wondered if that, yeah, uh, John, look, you look inspired. I'll, I'll turn it over to you, take it away. I think I think Paul had his hand up, so I didn't want to. Oh, after you, John. Uh, nothing, but sorry, I think. It's I, sorry, I meant I meant Paul, but go yeah. ahead, John. Uh, it's you, Paul. I guess the the great trap that I found myself falling into. Um, and I, I call it a trap for me, not for anyone else, is that when we say there is no supposed to happen, we create a supposed to happen. And, and so the thing I love about the field of, of possibility metaphor that comes out of kind of the philosophy of quantum physics and parallel universes and all that stuff is, and it also goes back to kind of the theory around um, humble inquiry of Edgar Schein and Pete Burden's leading consciously work, which is, that it's beautiful that there are always supposed to happen um, because we are loaded with um, assumptions and context and hidden agendas of organizations but the beautiful possibility of improvisation is simply to notice without judgment usually that's what we do in a place of play with yes and is there, you keep seeing the supposed to happen uh, and what you do is you just notice them and then some of them form part of your improvisation because you invent them anew. Other times you just notice they kind of float away and something else enters the space. But, but the danger of, of in, the improv rule of there is no supposed to happen is it simply becomes the biggest supposed to happen of all. I got it. Uh, there's, so this is... Um, one of the things that's happening right now is another aspect of presence. It's the, be, the ability to be able to give and take focus, uh, which is awkward in this form. It's much easier for me on the stage or in a room with participants in a workshop. But from my perspective, I wanna shift from talking about presence into talking about the give and take of focus, or in some cases, the give and take of control. 
And when I'm working with a facilitator who's completely in control all the time and they sort of hold control over the room, uh, I tend to just relinquish my, a lot of my energy and, and just follow along. Uh, and in some cases, that's, that may be what we want if we just want to give people rules and regulations. But in many cases, the learning experience uh, is, is much more uh, it, enriched by the active participation of the people in the room. So I wonder about, I'd love to just kick this around a little bit, the idea that giving control to your participants and giving and taking focus with and from you do as facilitators and whether that's in asking questions or just giving them the floor to make decisions how can we use that as facilitators anybody want to weigh in on that some people i can't see okay it doesn't look like it so okay, so um, my 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 relationship to give and take of oh cat yeah no no John has his hand up oh, um, I, I missed and it. at the top of your screen there might be a place where you can change your view so you can see us all sort of um, Hollywood Square style and you're um, muted yep uh, what I thanks you're uh, muted what I to say that that one thing that that uh, connects to me on the control there's some really great. Uh, research and often in outside of applied improv, but just in sort of facilitation training in general, there's this notion of holding space. Uh, and the idea behind it is there was a lot of research by Tavistock and the National Training Labs about uh, around 1946. It was after uh, the US dropped the bomb. And so they got very interested because small groups had the ability to make decisions that could be irreversible in their consequences. And uh, one of the dynamics that came up over and over were that groups. Um, pushed to have a leader, which was surprising. The thought was that leaders imposed themselves on groups, but that often uh, individual, that groups would really get anxious without a leader, would push someone to the leadership role, and then promptly, uh, as they were sort of pushing them up to the head of the room metaphorically, um, then they would behead them. Uh, sort of the, the, the idea is that uh, they would get to say, no, you were in charge, and now it's not my problem. And so the people who most had the ability to affect change relinquished that control. So it was sort of intentional dependency. Uh, that was going on. And so then one of the roles of professional facilitators is to take that role that groups may want to put you in as the role of an authority figure or parent, because my conflict resolution background, it was um, be a judge instead of being a mediator. Uh, and then so one of the jobs of the facilitator is to be in that role, but then not to take that authority and control and power. And sometimes it would be loose, like you're just going to structure, um, here are the containers in which we occur. So you're sort of like setting up the scene, but not controlling the scene in improv uh, setting. Uh, and then there's other uh, designs like open space uh, as one of the models where it's very little, where it's sort of intentional that the facilitator's role is to be uh, the, the leader label that people want, but really your job is just to pick up coffee cups and to help support the room uh, and be able to do that. And so that, that being one of the important roles that goes on. So that's what comes to mind when and you said about this idea about control and giving that over to the group. Yes, and, and one of the things that uh, that is in the description, for those who came in a little later, in the chat area, there is a description, a working description for uh, the, the facilitator compens comp <laughs> competencies, being able to say competencies is one of them, by the way. Facilitator competencies for AIN facilitators. And uh, one of the, the working description uh, refers to status as, and uh, so I'm talking about giving and taking control, giving and taking focus. And status methods that we use for doing that. Certainly someone who's just supporting the room so that the conversation can be held uh, may behave like they have lower status. Uh, and sometimes the, the status is taking the stage with a louder voice and more commanding presence. Uh, so it's, it's status, it's focus, it's control, but the ability to engage people in the room, activating the people in the room is, is how I see it. So I wanna activate the people in this virtual room. Is there anybody else who has methods for giving or taking control? Kat? Um, I, don't, I don't know if this is an answer to that question, uh, exactly. Uh, it's not an answer to that question. 
but the thought that was in my head as we're having both of these conversations is um, what always comes up for me is that intent feels important. It is what is sort of the uber competency or the core competency underneath all of these things. So sometimes when we're having conversations about um, is there a, do we, do we enter a training with um, a specific result in mind for the training? Like, is there a right outcome for the training or not? Or how much control do I have in the room versus how much, how much am I leading as the facilitator versus how much space am I leaving for the participants to lead in any given moment? Uh, how much control for all of that? Um, I, it, it feels to me like there isn't a right answer to those questions, but that's the right question. And that any given moment as a facilitator, what great facilitators do is have that question in mind at any given moment and make choices where the choices they're making are aligned with their intention moment to moment. And that what they're doing is actually aligned with the with, with the outcome that they want or the, it, the effect they're meaning to have and that they know what that is. So I guess I'm curious about, about the, how that lands, if people feel like we should be clear about the intention that we're having or that we want to be having versus um, whether, whether we need to know the impact we're going to have when we try something. I mean, I guess there, you can even do that. Like, I'm just going to try something and see how it lands. But it feels like even that intention should be intentional to go like, I don't know what if impact this is going to have. I'm just going to try it. But I feel like I'm intentional even if I'm doing that. So. Kat, would you identify the question that you hold in mind once again? Um, I guess the question that I'm always asking is, uh, it is probably just simply like what what's my intention like what am I trying to achieve or what, what you know what do I want to offer what impact do I want to have how am I trying to help some version of that and and that it's participant focused right like what am I trying to give or how am I trying to what am I trying to do for my partner and Kat can I just ask a question on that just in terms of stepping away from the facilitator context just to say uh, if it's possible a pure improvisational state um, mm -hmm. What, why does an improviser need an intention? I don't know if an improv, well, if I'm a, I don't know what pure improv means. Uh, Paul and I had a conversation at one point where we said, you know, all improv is applied improv, really. If I'm on stage, I'm applying it to a performance art where the goal is to entertain an audience who is paying to be entertained, right? So in that sense, I might say it, I might answer the question that way. <clears throat> um, but I don't know. I think, I, so on some level, my, my intention is to provide entertainment to a paying audience and or delight my partner that I'm playing with because we're doing this for fun with each other or to feel fulfilled and go home happy if I'm just doing it for myself. Um, so that's one level of it. On another level, maybe the answer is nothing. But in the context of facilitation and applied improv, I think I have a responsibility to the participants in the room um, not to waste their time and to provide what they think they're coming for because I'm serving them. I think I have a, a, an example of where that comes up in, at least for me, in, in, performative, in performance improv. Um, if you're doing a a particular format, let's say an Armando or deconstructed narrative where you have a story and you notice, oh, I've got, I, I see a fun idea of a comedic premise in this. And I might initiate a scene with that really as the focus of that. And so we have a clear idea of this is the core fun thing of the scene. We're gonna heighten this and explore this. And we're sort of, it's not that there are wrong answers in the scene, but there's sort of the natural occurrence. But then at some point, something occurs in the scene that's outside that, that sort of, we, we might consider it tangential. Now they're tangents because we have a focus to the scene. Uh, and it can be tempting uh, when we're just focused on, oh, how can we just develop this one thing? 
to not notice this funny quirk that just happened. Maybe someone um, gave a misspoke when they said a line or something, but something came out funny. And to people go, no, that's the interesting thing right now. Uh, at least in the US, there's often sort of two sides of improv. It's really awesome. On one, there's this game approach where it's, oh no, we always have a clear game or a clear comedic premise and things are off focus from that um, or off game. And another perspective, we're, we're a train, we, we're on the tracks, right? There's sort of a path to go. Uh, and then the other view is that it's all about mindfulness, that, that to improvise like a crow, that whenever you follow whatever the shiny thing is in front of you, um, and I often joke that I like to improvise like a crow on a train, that, uh, that, that often we find a core funny thing of the scene, it really, and it gets some momentum, it's easier that way. It's nice that we sort of have some like, oh, I see the next beat coming along with this. But then to still, and it's hard because they're contradictory things, to then not, um, not, not notice when something off that happens and to be able to follow and explore that. I feel that same kind of tension exists and duality exists in doing good work, that um, if I went into every training with a completely blank slate of, I'm just going to be present in the moment, I don't know that that would go that well. Uh, and likewise, if I, have a, I know what every minute it's going to happen, uh, then I'm going to miss a lot of great opportunities and it's just going to be, tr be trying to drag my uh, group along. Uh, and so finding that balance uh, is part of the art uh, and some of the fun challenge of it for me. I think it is that both and. And to pick up on what Paul was saying earlier, there's some paradoxical elements and Kat's ideas about intention. But it struck me paradoxically, I've just done a facilitation of a conference and that it was a lot easier to be present when the sessions had been properly designed, either by, by me or by the session leaders. There was a series of sessions because then things run more smoothly, typically. Um, there's a focus and a clear intent piece by piece and you can give your attention to the various movements and signals in the room where people have something to add that's useful so the paradox is the, the more the session is designed or prepared the easier it is to be present in that moment rather than having to juggle infinite amounts of things that are distracting from or taking uh, ourselves away from the purpose of that session. I think Kat, that you had your hand up. Cat? No? Okay, good. Uh, I, Paul? Just jazz, jazz hands to oh, what like John was saying. Gotcha. Okay, good. Yes. Paul, did you start to say something? Yeah, it was just what Paul said and also inspired by John with the performative stuff. What hit the, uh, a new insight for me or maybe a, yeah, just a surprise was up in Edinburgh where I go every year talking. I did lots of interviews for a book I'm writing with, with improv troops and groups and um, I asked the question um, so you know when you're on stage is there intention and some of that I mean these people are professional improvisers doing it as a full-time job and what they said was yeah we always realize the intentions afterwards looking back which is kind of what what's come up in the conversation um, and if intentions come up during the performance like what am I doing next if that's the thought in someone's head they said it, it means we haven't rehearsed enough. And you know, a lot of people hear that as paradoxical, but what they do is they spend hours and hours before the show or the tour rehearsing the intention. And so if the intention is uh, to improvise a long form serious drama, then they rehearse and do loads and loads of activities and exercises around that skill. And if it's about comedy and the intention is to get big laughs and people booking tickets and you know, um, but you know telling their friends to come they do days and days of warm-up the only thing they don't rehearse is the show um and so then when they're in the zone they go on stage and do something amazing and lots of people told me they come off saying how was it what happened and so yeah i guess that's a, the issue for me is that um you get so good at the skill is that you you notice the intention and then make it make it disappear. You're muted, Rebecca. Sorry, there, there's a conversation in the chat about meta intention. David asks, is there intention and meta intention? And then Kat asks what meta intention uh, 
uh, let's see what it means. So um, meta intention, uh, uh, David, uh, could you, would you uh, burst that out a little bit, explore that a little more? Yeah, I'm exploring with everyone else. I just came to me as a question, but so if I'm in a scene, I might have an intention of I'm coming in, I have a sense of where the story's going, but then I also have this larger intention of I want to be present, I want to be supportive. And then I could even have a larger intention of I want to support improv in my community or something. So so I'm wondering if there's I mean, how do we always hold intention with an open hand? You know? Yeah, I'm curious what people think about, yeah. Well, my, my <clears throat> excuse me, my, um, I, have a, I have about a billion intentions in my life that are related to billion, maybe I'm exaggerating, a million, that seem to be related to improvisation that, and I often feel as though I'm putting on a different hat in a different, every different situation. If I'm teaching some people the basics of improv, I'm wearing one hat. If I'm using the basics of improv in order to help a new group in an organization become a team, then I'm wearing a different hat. And uh, yeah, and my, my, my intention, I try to make my intention with any group of participants in a workshop, whether they are our students or, uh, or participants uh, that I wouldn't call students for some reason, I try to make the intention about, about their learning experience. That's very vague, but focus on, uh, on their, yeah, focus on their learning. And my intention is to bring, bring uh, practices and ideas that might help their learning go in, in whatever different direction might be useful to them. Like here, the intention is to get you guys talking about this. So meta intention, it's like, could that be like the, the larger int intention, large intestine, large intention, or those that we sort of put on the back burner? I see that Erica wants to come in, but I was reminded of the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I don't know if you, you have that one. And w whatever intentions we might have, there's still these behaviors, visible, physical elements of presence that are more interesting to me than mentalistic concepts. Erica, you want to weigh in? Sure, this conversation is all over. Um, so intention, I do have, I was just looking at a workshop I'm teaching tomorrow, right? And with my co-facilitator, we have this practice of setting intentions. So there's, there are the intentions of uh, leaving with new skills, but really I think in my heart and in our heart, it's like, how do we want them to feel? How do we want them to feel individually and as a group at the end? And that's what, and we sort of <laughs> define that, right? So then we can look in the debrief, you know, the next day, okay, what was this like? And we're kind of managing, it's really, helpful to be managing for that the whole time. And when I design like the content, like I'm teaching something about communication and clarity and confidence, I, I build in like different tracks. I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure these are like the main beats that, this, that are involved in this topic. But then I may have, you know, four different activities or concepts that go, sorry, I have a little background noise. We have a snow day here, just like, just so you guys can see, like, this is what it looks like here. <laughs> there is no school. <laughs> um, uh, I'll build in, I'll like build in these different tracks. So then, because I really don't know what that group is going to be about. And I don't know what, they may spend a lot of time in one area. So I just, I feel like it's this constant back and forth of like, who is this group? And what do they seem to be wanting? And where are they curious? And just, and knowing that I'm prepared to kind of go down these different roads, depending on the responsiveness of, you know, how it's going with that group. That's, yeah. That also raises a, a question for me, um, that I wonder, Eric, if you've got any insights onto that, which is some of, actually the majority of the improv groups I spoke to, 
definitely had something I, I wrote in my diary as themness. So I'm here as an actor called a facilitator or performer. And then there's this thing called the audience. The things I do are going to have an impact on them and their reaction can be different. But certainly one or two of the groups said, there is no them, there is only us. So yeah, what relationship are you seeing between like what I shared and like that concept? Well, I, I think I heard love in your heart um, because you want, you want good to happen. There, there's this kind of benevolent intention in you. There's nothing that you said that was, when I work with this group tomorrow, we're gonna harm them. Um, we're going in with a kind of, of, of a benevolence around it. Um, and when the people said there's only us, when there's only us, we have to create a shared intention. Um, it could end up bad because we don't know where it's going to go. It's the facilitator is a collaborator in a process that's unknown that they call improvisation. And what comes out, we don't know. And, and some of the scenarios, anyone that's a consultant will know in that state that you can get thrown out. Uh, you know, it, it goes somewhere where it doesn't maximize your chances of getting booked again. Um, and so, you know, the, it's not an answer. It was just I noticed that you were framing tomorrow in a very benevolent way that needed you to have an intention going in that had goodness in your heart. I guess that comes down to maybe a core belief that I have is people are naturally, naturally want to connect, naturally want to grow, naturally want to be creative, naturally want to support each other, like that that's underneath whatever. And so that's there with me, that's there with them. And my job as a facilitator is to create the environment so that that can come through, like to lower the stakes, to set people up for success so they can experience that little edge of where are we operating at our best? Where are our insights emerging? Where are we able to share a little bit more? And it, there's no, you're right, I have no fear of the people in the room because I'm like, oh wow, look at these people. You know, here are these, I guess I trust my ability to, to, re to respond to the people who are right in front of me in a way that, that um that reaches there's a lot now that background noise I don't think is me <laughs> it was you um I think from the moment we walk in the room that's our job is to respond and if so if, if the if someone there is like tense it's like okay how do I you know what's going on with them how do I how do I respond to that so that they um start coming out of that space and more into their true self. I, know, I guess it does sound very benevolent and everything, but it's very powerful, you know? It's, um, I've never had a co-created horrible experience, I guess, because it's a, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering or responding to exactly what you're saying. So it looks like maybe Lisa wants to say Yeah, Lisa. So, okay, so I have a really inter interesting couple of experiences lately from some groups, but this conversation about presence takes me back to an early training I had in facilitation, had nothing to do with improv, uh, had all, all experiential education, um, where we were, kept talking about energy multiplies, good, bad, or indifferent, and how, as we go back to that phrase, we hold space for you know, whatever's about to happen. Um, and I, I feel like that presence is kind of, for me, it's that energy too. So I walk into the room, if I'm nervous and apprehensive or, you know, things are going on, I notice that that starts to populate the group, whether, whether I, you know, it just happens. Likewise, if I walk in kind of Zen-like and just kind of, you know, like this is gonna be the best day of your life, and you know you're just going to be able to experience something new from talking to, mainly to myself but also for the group um once i know what their intention is and what they want to see what their group looks like at the end of the our session if i if that's really crystal clear then whatever happens in the room is is what needed needed to happen um 
and I take a little bit of the open space uh, uh, protocols into some of my, some of my work as well as the right people are there. What happened is what needed to happen. Um, and most recently, the a group, a huge group I was working with, they said, "Hey, we've got <laughs> we've got some extra time for you." And I was like, "What do you mean?" It's like we have extra thirty minutes. Will you can you fill that? And I was like yeah I can feel that and I had to go back to what their intention was for that day and they were going through a huge reorg people were not ple pleased and but they still wanted people to work together and talk and um, and so I gave that time back to the group I just expanded the debrief like my early facilitation time I would probably would have filled it with five different activities <laughs> but I kept going back to what do they need and what energy needs to happen in that room and what transformation needs to happen in that room. And they just need to rebuild their trust with each other. And so I just expanded that debrief time and it was, it, it was uh, a revelation to me, but for that group, it was so impactful and set that three day conference up. They, they went through a lot of the, uh, the stuff that they thought was gonna be really resistant kind of breeze through it. And I feel like that we, I, I know myself as a facilitator, I, I run that, uh, the rails of like, oh, I've done this before. I know how this works. I know the outcomes usually versus what if I come about this in a fresh way and in a new way, a new presence and a new, um, like really look at this exercise. What else can come from this exercise? I feel like I'm much more present with the work and I don't feel like, oh my God, I've done this game 500 times before to go, oh, this is their first time. And to be like, oh, being that shock and awe of like, wow, that was really a great game. And have that energy multiply from, you know, from the facilitator on to the, to the rest of the group. It's just some thoughts I'm dealing with right now. So. I, I love that. Thank you very much, Lisa. The yeah, well, that, that confers for me something that started with Rebecca, which is this word grounded, which is that it is part of the role to hold the space for the best of what we are and can be, whatever that turns out to be. I don't know where the background is noise is coming from, but uh, because everyone's muted at one point. There is a lot of background noise that I'm hearing. Is anyone else hearing it? No? Yes? No? All right, Not Matt, now. you I got something, Matt. Well okay. Matt, you. Yeah, I unmuted. it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I've been teaching an annual retreat for the 30 facilitators in my company. Rebecca, you, you know this, this group because you came in. Um, did some sessions for us. <clears throat> and I always put the same intention out at the beginning, which is we're going to go out, each of you is going to go out and teach about building community. But unless you have a felt deep sense of it, much deeper than what you're going to teach, you're not going to be able to do that in a genuine way. So this four day gathering, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> it, I'm going to stand up, hang on. <clears throat> is about building a sense of community uh, among us. So you really have that to draw on. And um, opening that up to the facilitators, I mean, to the participants, can be really scary sometimes. I know people have encouraged that happening, but I'm thinking of <clears throat> a time where the African-American facilitators really wanted to vent some stuff and it got to, um, we got to a really difficult place before it resolved. And I mean, that, that was actually successful in the end. One of the women said, this is actually the only mixed race group that I feel safe speaking my truth in, which was great. But more recently than that, we had a huge hashtag me too um, thing where um, one of the men who actually was not present in the room that year um, the women were just furious with this guy. And for me, 
trying to be um, what we call present in the, in the face of just fury, um, you know, not directed at me personally, but in the room, was insanely challenging. Um, and the only thing that I could kind of do was to um, not lead, but moderate with compassion. Um, and I mean, this was two years ago, and it still, um, still has repercussions. One of the women recently said, a friend of mine at UCLA teaches social justice, and I'd really like you to have a conversation with her. I mean, people are, are, are still trying to educate um, all of us, including me. Um, I, I'm just trying to, to talk about being present in, in, in the face of stuff that's uncomfortable and unexpected. Um, and let me, let me just circle back to one other thing. I used to always try to lead by consensus to get everybody to agree. And my situation is special because it's my company, but a, 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 a facilitator who I, I had come in work with us once said to me, no, you don't understand. Your job is not to get everybody to agree. Your job is to make it safe for everybody to be able to state their truth and for you to make the final decision because people are waiting for you to decide. So um, that, I mean, I know that's not the usual coming in and facilitating, although maybe it is sometimes, but that actually has been such a relief for me to understand that um, people can empower a leader as long as they feel taken care of and heard. That's beautiful and it speaks to uh, the evolution of our society. It was a consensus was what we did in the, for me, it was the 60s and 70s. And now we're in a place where the world is changing so rapidly and we're, we are, the world's getting smaller and bigger at the same time. We, we have, we have people in the room who are different ages, different levels of education, really different kinds of, of uh, experiences, you know, grow, growing up, being alive even. <laughs> so uh, be making, uh, making the room space for a real variety of people, it can be very challenging. I, I want to, so, so Matt, thank you for that. I want to, um, point out something that Kat asked. She had to go to another call, another meeting, but I wanted to point out something that she mentioned in the chat. Uh, so I'll say we, we have talked about presence in a lot of different ways, giving and taking control or focus or status and intention among other things. What else from, from the wisdom in the room here, I'd like to know what, what else makes for presence? What, what, when you think of, of yourself as having presence or, um, or if you might leave a, leave a presentation or an experience saying that person has, really has presence, what components are there in presence? Can, can we uh, take it apart a little bit more? I think we've talked about a few, oh, we're raising hands. Yeah. No, I uh, wanted we're back to up talking. <laughs> I wanted to respond to Patrick's question and to what Matt said, and I think it's an answer to what Rebecca's just asked. So this idea of witnessing, maybe it's a fancy word for listening carefully and, and staying in the room, even while uncomfortable or surprising things are said. I think the, the uncomfortable is the bit that is less familiar to improvisers. We're very comfortable with the unexpected, because that's the stock in trade. The uncomfortable maybe is witnessed uh, in the way the word is used by narrative therapists, for example, who will listen to somebody's story, maybe without saying anything at all while the story is being told, because it's important that it is heard, listened to, witnessed in that sense and that that could be broadened as a skill for improvisers or facilitators is to, as part of the present, is noticing carefully what's going on, 
without prejudice as to what we're going to do next, if anything. Uh, John. Uh, two things that have come to mind on hearing it. One is, I mean, my, my formal training is in conflict resolution, and it's one of the things about facilitating that is that it's when there's deep conflict, it's, I, I feel like we feel most tempted to want to jump in and fix it often, which is when, of course, that's the biggest trap because we are the ones with the least power to affect the conflict that others are in. Uh, and so sort of recognizing that and getting uh, comfortable with that and finding out, of course, I had to get a call then, um, uh, finding out sort of where our own individual triggers are, that for some folks, when things get very emotional, we go, oh, no, we want to get down, or we want to go, oh, no, we need to stop that. And I think that's things, um, sort of learning about yourself as an instrument uh, for that and how that plays out and how that goes uh, for it, so that that becomes a big part of what we're doing for facilitation and doing the work. The other thing I wanted to mention on what we bring for present that hasn't been closed, um, emotional tone. I think that that's when we know from scenes that you can have the same you know, text of the scene, but the emotional tones are really important. And thinking about what the emotional energy you bring are, and I'm very aware that like, that seems nebulous, but it's really critical and finding, um, and that there's not a right answer, that at least in conflict resolution, um, there's often one of two forms that works. One is there's some facilitators who are just incredibly empathic and supportive and they want to be there and, there. and others uh, and I fall in this who are kind of irrelevant uh, irrelevant irreverent uh, and humorous and like oh yeah this is a huge fucking mess and being able to say that in in the group uh, but um, whatever it is having a sense of joy and optimism being a really important thing to bring uh, and that uh, how that plays out can go a lot of different ways but sort of that emotional state that you're in and that you hold I found that to be one of the most important and sort of defining things that has changed and evolved for me in the facilitation work I do. And what most separates individual facilitators when it when you think about what works for one facilitator may not work for another. Uh, and that sort of emotional intelligence and that emotional work that you're doing with the group, um, both for modeling and just often uh, being the cheerleader uh, for the group, I find to be really an important and effective thing. Well put. I, the 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 emotional state of uh, of being open and trusting and uh, reading the room, empathetic, uh, is is sort of, it's that tends to be my style, and that wouldn't work for everybody. It just doesn't, and it's not. I mean, we can't ask Paul Z. Jackson to change his personality in order to facilitate. He's terribly successful as he is, so. <laughs> It's an interesting conversation. There's also there's some lovely conversation in the in the chat on the sidebar about about witnessing and just being a, available to your audience. And I want to hearken back to that moment of when there's deep conflict, uh, the, the urge to repair it, and as a very uh, kind of hyper vigilant, um, empathetic facilitator, the, when I was a young when I was young, my urge would be to fix it if there was a conflict in the room. <laughs> I see people nodding. And when I had the experience of working with a very, a, a brilliant facilitator, his name was Mark Milliman. Uh, he was one of the authors of Surfing the Edge of Chaos. And one of his methodologies, whenever the, uh, uh, you know, an outlier, emerged with you know being able to identify the conflict or speak their truth and, and it was not popular and indeed it felt dangerous to the room he would give like all this positive energy to that person and and amplify that message with with this positive energy with something like this is great I'm so glad you said that. And he'd pull that energy up into the room to, to, to identify the crisis. And I saw him take intractable groups with intractable problems. But while they may not be solved when they're intractable, they're often not solved in a weekend. While it may not be solved, having something identified as the problem that emergence can transform an organization. Yeah, I'm David, I'm gonna turn it. Yeah, that triggered a thought, Rebecca, of um, so what's happening? Why does that, why is that so transformative? And what I'm wondering is if often in organizations, things are suppressed. 
right? That that isn't happening. We're pretending as if it's not. And so being present to it, and and so maybe one part of presence at times could be to amplify it, to bring some, put a spotlight on it, bring some attention to it. And and not just attention to it, because it's there could be different kinds of attention, like shaming, like, no, no, you shouldn't have that. But what I'm hearing is, this is good. This is really juicy. Let's look at this together. And, and hopefully we've created a supportive container so that we can look at that. And maybe people don't feel that supportive container normally. And so it's been pushed down. Yeah, my experience is when, when I get pushed back now, I give it, I, I give it space. And sometimes uh, some of the participants will argue for me or for the idea that I've, you know, I'm training. <laughs> I, and I'm not asking for that. You know, they'll say, no, no, that's not, that's not the problem or whatever. <laughs> but the experience of every participant feels vital. And yeah, not letting them bully the group, but, but to, yeah, to, to elevate ideas. Uh, oh. Yeah, Elisa. Yeah. So that goes to another thing. Um, an, another training I had was, uh, this is more, I guess, a transformative work, an interpersonal, uh, interpersonal work, but is that as a facilitator, we are mirrors for our group and how we, you know, again, go back to hold that space or deal with those situations that come up, good, bad, or indifferent, allows people to go, oh, oh, that's one way of, oh, okay, that's that's a cool way of dealing with that or I've never thought of it that way and that we get to kind of train on site like that group I was talking about earlier I was able to help them choose into you know offer opportunities for them to choose into healthy communication and I was there for oversight so it's like we have that ability to really mirror that behavior that's going to be much more productive in that community even though we're technically not in that community, perhaps, but um, we just get to, we get to model that behavior and say, "Hey, you, you, this is this is another option." Thank you. Uh, so there's a, there's a few ideas that are popping up. Presence is being a mirror to the group, holding the space, uh, spaciousness. Uh, the, the idea of witnessing, and one of the things that Paul uh, Levi said, or is it Levy? One of the things that he said is uh, is the idea that it's not it's not the facilitator and the participants, but rather it's it's us. So it's a group of people in an experience together. Um, it, yeah, is there anything else that I that for you when when we say presence, is there anything else that pops up? And, and you can share that in the sidebar or bring it up. I would like to resolve, end this conversation pretty soon because I thought it was a one hour conversation, my bad. And I've got, I've got someone coming over to repair our, our Wi-Fi. You guys have been freezing while, while you talk on, on my end. So, <laughs> so I've got- That's fast yeah. service. Yeah, no. Oh, I called it in yesterday, but um, but yeah, I saw David. I saw your hand, and and let's go for a few more minutes. This this is a great conversation, by the way. I'm I'm having a great time, David. I was just raising my hand for Paul's Ed because he was, yeah. I'm over here. Can you hear that? Oh, so Paul's in the dark because he has jet lag. Paul. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to put a word in for some of the more obvious and superficial elements of presence like having a, a strong clear voice uh, I think that uh, body language is very important that someone who has presence is able to be still uh, and and hold the room that sort of take take up space and command the room i think one thing that for, for me that comes up is when i think of a uh, stage presence i often think about like, if you're interested in a show like confidence this is going to be great you know, the audience doesn't worry about your show and yet there are times when i think that i've had good critical moments particularly in facilitating conflicts 
where uh, the most effective thing I've done is to say, well, I'm stumped uh, and what's gonna go from there to sort of share the difficulty um, and not sort of trying to project um, an, a notion of infallibility or I've got all the answers for you because that's exactly what you don't want to have as your role. Uh, and so that that's part of it as well. Uh, so often uh, initially you're opening the stage with confidence, but then also being willing to share like, yeah, it seems like we've got a lot of frustrations and things are going around in a circle. What do we want to do about that? As opposed to acting like, oh, I've, I'm a magician and I know this trick that I can pull out of my hat to help make others' problems go away instead of recognizing that that's, that's the case. Uh, and the other thing is um, presence for me is kind of, if you say like be more present, I'm like, ah, I don't know what that feels like. Um, for me, it's often digging into curiosity that that's, that's often thing for me, just being curious, which is where I get to the um, trying, trying to be surprised. I think trying to lean into that because I, I know that like everyone else, I'm bad at being surprised. I tend to put all the cognitive dissonance and all the other uh, filters, perceptive filters we have and confirmation bias to avoid that, to really try to notice um, what I don't expect. I love it. Anything else? I was thinking we'll of an, 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 yeah, an example of presence and what came to mind was at AIN Stony Brook at Gabe Mercado's session, and I forget which day, but we were in a long oval of chairs, if any of you were there. And he I shared a game. Yeah, he shared a game with us. And I just remember at the very beginning, the way he was standing. And, and so I'm just, if you can remember that, or a, any kind of example of when you've seen others have presence, what did that look like or feel like? But he commanded our attention. And there was a sense of spaciousness. He was grounded, confident, and I felt connected with him. It was a sense of spaciousness. You know, wanna, it's, oh, go ahead. It's in the chat because I've been having fun chatting away with everyone. Um, but Patrick brought up like using a microphone and I just wanted to reiterate that like using like a wireless mic is so lovely because then you can walk around the room like you're all talking about. You can use your body language and you can use like this tone of voice and you can get quiet or you can get big and you're not like in this like I have a strong voice everyone can hear me right you know that really limits your responsiveness and your presence so just saying again yes everyone use microphones so you can be um, inclusive and responsive I think it relates to our conversation here in my improvisation workshops, I have a lot of people who come and take them who have never done any, hi kid, <laughs> they've never done any improvisation before. And one of the things that I address is, is that you need to be learn to be heard and to be seen because the improv uh, impulse sometimes when someone is new to it is to disappear, to hide behind others, turn their back on the audience, talk very quietly so that no one can hear what they have to say. And so just being heard and seen is part of what confidence looks like. The, uh, one of the things that we're doing is, you know, AIN is we're trying to identify the competencies that make for great facilitators. And what some of what we've has come up today has been invaluable. We've gone, we've gone very deep, and uh, and I love that we're ending with some of what I perceive as the more obvious things that you need to be heard and seen. Uh, uh, let's take uh, let's take a couple more minutes. Any anything else? Let's just popcorn. I think one thing that's interesting when you do competencies, because we in graduate school, we're doing you know, how does someone pass a class in information that there's both here are competencies that someone needs to have. So there's all this sort of here that kind of need to demonstrate. And at the same time, it also starts to look like not so much for improv, but what you hear often more often described in stand up comedy that when comics get really great, um, no other comic can really be like them. It's not the jokes. It's really they're better at being themselves. Uh, and so there's that element as well of it. So there's both, how do we get these shared competencies? And then what is it for this individual? What does their great facilitation look like? And that's going to be different for different people. Absolutely. So it's the ability to be yourself, to be open, to listen, to expect to be surprised, to have intention, to really listen, and be there with your participants, as well as training all this stuff that we've got to train. <laughs> okay. 
That Thank sounded you. like a conclusion, Rebecca. That was my, that was, that was where I was heading. Very, Thank you very, very much, everyone, for coming. Paul, anything in closure? Yeah, I want to thank you, Rebecca, and thank all the participants for your physical, virtual presence and your comments spoken and comments written. Uh, the chat, I hope, will be available al <coughs> alongside the recording because there's some really nice summary points and questions that were raised there. So this will be available as a recording. And um, there is one more big topic before, before the end of the year. Look out for that on the website, the Facebook page, and possibly a newsletter. And if you'd like to offer a topic for next year or to host one of the drop-in social chats where there's no topic but an emergent agenda, then email me and let me know. We're starting to compile next year's programme right now. So all offers and suggestions or even requests are welcome. So I'm gonna end the recording. So if anyone has anything to say that they want to say that won't be recorded, we'll be able to do that in a moment. I'm stopping the recording right now.